Welcome to the RF Elements Unlicensed Podcast. I'm Caleb. As always, we've got Tassos over here. Say hi, Tassos. Hi, Tassos. Hi, Tassos. And this week, we're joined by host Cameron Crum from Regulatory Solutions. So we're going to be talking about the BDC. Dun, dun, dun. We're going to be talking about regulatory things, GIS mapping. We'll see where the conversation goes. But uh, before we hop into this conversation, real quick, Tassos, give the good people out there their call to action. Yes, absolutely. Don't forget to like, listen, or subscribe to our channel right here on YouTube or anywhere you download your audio podcasts like Apple, Google, or Spotify. All right, all right. So let's go ahead and jump to it. So Cameron, my man, we really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day to talk to us today and tell us about, like I said, the BDC and all this regulatory stuff. You know, it's a really hot topic. You know, when it first, th this stuff started coming out, there was a lot of freaking out across the industry, I think. And, you know, now it seems like this is not an insurmountable goal. We can get this done. But, you know, I think the more information and the more light that we can shed, especially with those deadlines and stuff coming up and clear through the FUD, I think it's going to help everybody out there get a better understanding as to what's going on. So, again, appreciate it. Um, uh, take the time, go ahead and run through just kind of a quick introduction of like who you are, uh, kind of how you've gotten into this space and you know, what, what's, what has led you up to this day? <laughs> wow. Well, okay. Uh, that's, that's quite a bit, but, um, so, you know, I have a background in wireless engineering, kind of started in my career in the cellular world, uh, did a bunch of network design around the or actually around the world. I was in about uh, three different countries over the course of about seven years uh, doing cellular network design, 12 different cities, and then uh, got into the, obviously the WISP space, um, built a WISP, ran it for about eight years, sold that to Jab in the process of running that. Uh, you know, I wrote the WISMON software, which was a billing, you know, billing and kind of all encompassing platform like they are these days and sold that to Sonar in 2017. And, um, you know, did a couple things uh, between that time. But one of the things I got into, you know, when running Wismon, we, we did a lot of um, mapping. In fact, that's how, that, that's how the whole thing started was we wanted to map and monitor our network and just have an application that we could just bring up and see our network status on a map on the screen anytime we wanted. And that's really kind of how it started. That's where the name came from. Wismon was kind of Wist Monitor. And so, um, so, so I had this background in GIS. I'd also written an RF propagation uh, program for the cellular industry back in the late 90s, early 2000s. And that program was based in uh, a platform called MapInfo, which, which used to be a big competitor to Esri. Uh, they were kind of they were kind of the two big competing platforms in the telecom space at the time, and and the base of that platform was written in Map Info, and I had kind of become this Map Info expert. I was in these local user groups and teaching, you know, people how to use it and that kind of stuff. And they had a little interface called Map Basic that you could you know kind of write your own custom uh, GIS applications into, and so I built propagation on top of that and sold it. Uh, you know, had some moderate success. So I had this background in in both RF and GIS. So that was kind of a natural fit into writing, you know, Wismon for myself. And so that kind of led us into, you know, once we got uh, started getting customers and things, the FCC of course came out with the 477 requirements back in the late, you know, whatever you call them, the aughts, I guess. And so we started the aughts. <laughs> oh, back, you know, in oh, oh, nine, back in the aughts. Whatever, oh, seven, oh, eight. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so we started writing, uh, you know, people started asking us if we could help with that. And of course it was, it was a pretty easy thing back then to plug that into Wismon. And then, you know, people said, well, I don't even know how to file. Could you file for us? So we, for an extra little fee, we would actually file their 477s every year. So once I sold Wismon, we, um, you know, we started getting requests from our former customers. They said, well, we don't know how to do this still. Can you help us? And so I said, yeah, sure. I can, I can help you out. So I had, you know, I had a, a handful of people that I was doing it for. And then over the years, people have been referring other people to me on Facebook. So now twice a year, I have this big group of people who come to me and ask me to do this stuff. So I track it and keep a pretty good eye on what's going on. And of course, this BDC stuff that came about, um, you know, now we have to get really granular 
uh, down to the address level with their fabric and all that stuff. So, um, so that's where we are. And uh, that's what kind of led me to this point. Um, so, you know, the, the new company I have is, you know, just was kind of born out of this need. There was just really nobody doing the full service. I mean, there's, there's other, there's other people doing parts of it, you know, some, some, the propagation stuff or overlays and being able to get some address lists, but nobody's really putting it all together. And so that's kind of where, uh, you know, where we came up with this, uh, this company. So, and, you know, as a side note, I also still work, you know, pretty much full time for VISP as their CTO. So it's still, it's still a, uh, <laughs> you know, these are, this is kind of a side project, but it's, but it, obviously it's very important. And, uh, you know, we brought in uh, Brian Webster as well, because he has a, a big uh, background in mapping. And then of course, my former partner from, um, from uh, Wispon, Robert Olive, is uh, is helping me out on the business side of things, and so um, we just you know we just needed some some other expertise because we're going to be really busy as it is. Mm -hmm. So, but um, but anyway, this this new requirement is I know it's really uh, kind of confounding people, and and there's uh, I see all the discussion going on, and it's it's you know almost hourly. There's some new post about it you know, people either complaining or figuring out, you know, what they're going to do or how they're going to do it. And, um, you know, we're, we're just trying to, trying to provide another resource to help. So, um, but, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be, I think, um, a difficult thing in our industry. Uh, it seems to me that the BDC was kind of put in place to um, almost to squash the little guys and because it is expensive, you know, to get the work done and to get the filing right. And it's expensive, really expensive if you get it wrong. Yeah. And, um, you know, so, so that's, that's kind of where we are with it. And, um, you know, we, we have, you know, we, we can get the PE certifications and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, it's, it's really difficult to find a PE. And I know that that's been a big uh, point of contention with the uh, the rules that they have they had this pe requirement even though initially i think they said that you could have an engineering officer i think they kind of clarified that in some of the report and orders where they they basically said well yeah it still has to be a pe and now they have this you know they've relaxed that for the next three filings but um it, it's a difficult thing to find i've been in this industry a long time i had a former partner in my propagation business that was a PE in, and he was registered in several states. Um, and he was one of the few people I knew in the wireless industry of all the, you know, the hundreds of engineers I've ran across in the cellular days and, and all that stuff. Uh, nobody had a PE. I mean, I knew two guys that had a PE and one of them was my partner. And so it just is not something that uh, double E's, who do RF or wireless design really, uh, really do because there's no test for it. So the, you know, when you, when you, to get a PE, you have to take, you know, what they call the EIT test and then work for a few years. And then you, you can go back and take the PE exam and the EIT kind of encompasses all aspects of engineering, right? So there's, there's components for like mechanical, civil, um, electrical, you know, whatever in the, in the EIT test. And so a lot, most people take it like fresh out of school because that's when all that stuff is fresh for them. And, and then, you know, you work for a few years and then you take the, the PE exam in your kind of your specialized field and they have different sections, uh, that you can do. So like the double E PE, there's, there's a couple different tests you can take depending on what you're doing. And uh, the one they recommend, if you're a, an RF guy, is the control systems and power systems test, which, mm -hmm. uh, you know, <laughs> I, I just don't, you know, it's it, okay. I mean, I get, I get that there's, you know, some wave theory and stuff in power systems and, and some things like that, but, it, but there's nothing really specific to doing wireless, uh, kind of wireless network design. And so one of the reasons that I never did it was for that. Uh, there just wasn't, wasn't a call for it. We weren't stamping anything you know we didn't have to certify anything in that world and so uh so there just aren't that many guys around that that know how to do this so um i talked to a few i, I knew one here in the dallas area that i've known for a lot of years and he's you know he's he's getting up there too i think he's in his you know mid to late 70s now and um i just don't know anybody else that that does it and then 
you know, we put out kind of some feelers because we wanted to have, you know, a couple guys on the, on the hook to, you know, just in case we got a huge volume of work, it does take time to review the data. And these guys aren't going to stamp it without their review because, you know, they're putting their license at risk. And um, so other guys that I talked to didn't know anything about wireless. And I was like, well, I'm not sure how you're going to review it and stamp it. You know, if you don't know what we're doing here, it's difficult to, you know, to do. So, so that's where we are, but we do have some resources available for that. It's been a struggle to get them, but we do have that. And um, hopefully that if people need it. We can provide that service. Okay. Well, stepping back and we'll loop back around on the PE part. Cause I think there's a, a lot of different debate and stuff going on around there, but to step it back a second, like the BDC, let's talk a little bit here about like, what is the BDC and what are the main differences between this new BDC filing and the 477 filings that people were doing or supposed sure. to be doing. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, let's talk a little bit about the differences between those and why this is kind of a, a much more of an onerous or at least sure. more in-depth process. Yes. Yeah, so, okay. So the, uh, the 477 consisted of a couple of different parts, right? You had your subscription file, which was, you know, basically the, you know, it was a classification of speed tiers and technology codes, right? A grouping of those and then it, within a, a given tract, right? So you had to report how many subscribers you had in a tract that had a certain technology code and a certain speed tier. And this is census tract, right? That's correct. That's correct. When I talk about tracks or blocks, these are census tracts and blocks, right? Which is kind of a, a large sort of grouping area. I'm trying to break right. this down, and yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is also so, not my exact wheelhouse too. The, the nitty gritty details. So for sure, I'm like, well, if I don't fully track, and I'm sure there's plenty of others don't. So if of I get course. a little uh, iterative on some of these questions, I no problem, no problem. Yeah, it's a, it's such old hat to me. I figure everybody knows this, but I guess you know that's that's a bad assumption on my part. So yes. so yeah, so the census tracks are kind of the biggest uh, you know boundary area they have for the census, right? So so it goes tracks uh, and then it, they break that down into what they call block groups and then of course individual blocks, which is kind of the smallest uh, entity within, you know, how they how they define a, a geographical region for the census. And so so the tracks are pretty big, right? So they just are trying to get kind of an idea, I think, of how many subscribers and what speeds can be av available for those kind of larger areas. And then they have what they call the deployment file, which, which uh, uses blocks, right? So you have to report in the blocks, again, uh, by speed tier and your your maximum uh, advertised <laughs> uh, consumer, right, uh, grade uh, bandwidth in that block, right? So uh, I think for the most part, you know, most people don't get down to, you know, oh yeah, I, this tower, it's got, you know, a lot of obstructions and I can really only provide, you know, 10 meg service over here where I provide a hundred meg service on this part of my network. Uh, I honestly, I've never seen anybody get that kind of granular on there on their census block. They kind of just take their maximum speed that they advertised out, out on the web and they say, oh yeah, I can provide that everywhere. And, um, you know, I'm going to throw that out there. So for every block that I, that I cover, uh, I'm going to say that I can provide that speed. And so there's no, there's no granularity there. There's no real, you know, okay, well, I really can't provide that in a lot of places. I can you know, maybe get half of that or a quarter of that or something just based on my network topology. Um, so, so anyway, it's, it's uh, still not very granular because if you can cover one person in a block, then, you know, th then you can say you cover the whole block. And the and block, block could is, be, <laughs> you're, you're about to yeah, answer yeah, the question a, a I was going to ask. It, it really depends um, on, on where it is in the country. I mean, a block could be, you know, 10 square miles in some places. And it could be, you know, it could be a, a quarter. I mean, it, it could be a couple of acres in another place. Right. I mean, it just really depends on population density and stuff like that. So, so, um, you know, again, you could cover a block that actually has one home in it. Right. And that's it. That's the only thing in that block. So, but you get to an urban area and now, you, you know, one block may have, you know, 2000 people in it. So it just really depends on, you know, on, on where it is in the country. So it's really not a great way <laughs> to determine where service is available, right? Because, you know, I think for the most part, most of the, especially wireless ISPs are operating in 
uh, you know, suburban to rural markets. And so, you know, those blocks tend to get pretty big, but there's not a lot of homes in them. So, you know, it's kind of this double-edged sword, you know? So yeah, I can cover this block because I serve as this one guy in the bottom corner of it, but you know, all these other people out there can't get service, you know, they're blocked by trees or whatever, but I still say I service the whole block. And the whole reason that like the 477 came about is basically the FCC saying, Hey, we didn't have some idea of what our actual coverage is. Right. I mean, cause Correct. to some extent mm-hmm. it's very much a, a, an educated guesstimate. And I guess you could kind of consider this a shotgun approach as to saying, you know, this percentage yeah. of this County or this city or this state or the country as a whole has coverage. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, it was kind of the smallest uh, geographical entity available. Right. And, and unless you want to get down to address levels. Right. Um, so, you know, address level uh, stuff is difficult because, you know, I mean, just just try to find an address in like northern New Mexico or Wyoming on Google Earth or Google Maps or something. I mean, you're 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 not finding it. I mean, it just their their coverage is pretty poor in some parts of the country, um, and and sometimes it just puts you in the middle of, of whatever the closest town is. You know, if you try to look something up. So, yeah. so trying to do that was was um, it just wasn't possible. So the FCC went out and co- uh, contracted with this company CostQuest to, to build this fabric. And I, I mean, if they, if they have what they say they have, which is addresses for the entire country, uh, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> I mean, I, I honestly don't know where the data uh, came from because China, you know, there's, there's not even, <laughs> yeah. National, yeah, there's not even a national E911 database there. I mean, they're trying to build one, um, and you can go look at that map, but there's some states that don't participate. Uh, and there's yeah. some counties within states that don't participate. There's some counties within some states that don't even have the information available themselves. And so, or, or it's, it's not online, right? You have to like physically go down and, and look up parcels and things like that uh, in order to get that information. And so that, that's what I'm saying. I mean, I, I don't know how long CostQuest has been working on this or how long they've been under contract to get this data, but it's pretty impressive uh, if they if they have what they say they have. So, you know. It's it's come from Amazon ring cameras, cell phones, <laughs> and, and tick, TikTok apps, you know? Right. <laughs> I don't think there's enough of those out there, honestly. I, you know. Yeah, there are, so, there are still some areas that are underserved by absolutely anything. So, yeah, it's yeah. It be pretty interesting to see how good it really is. Yeah. Because, you know, you get into like parts of, like I said, like New Mexico, Wyoming, some of these really rural States where there's just almost no population and there'll be a road with a bunch of mailboxes at the end of it. And that's the address. I mean, yeah, you know, they don't have a geolocated address on the house because not even the postman goes there, you know? So that those places, it'll be interesting to see. I know there's, there's one particular company that I deal with a lot every year when this comes around in, in VISP, uh, that, that has a pretty sizable footprint in Northern New Mexico. And we always have issues with their addressing because it just, uh, you know, it just is hard to find. You cannot find these physical addresses, you know? And so, uh, I, I, I'd be, I'll be curious to see how it turns out for them and, uh, and other people like them. Yeah, they're they're not going to take uh, address input as well. Turn where that old church burned down five right. years ago, and yeah. where Ethel used to live, right. right? So yeah, yeah. So you'd be surprised. <laughs> so <laughs> the FCC and the government man were like, all right, so we're going to put all this money into broadband. You know, this whole push through NTIA, you know, mm-hmm. and the the build back, whatever, so on and so forth. So they decided that they need the the four seventy seven wasn't adequate to fully gauge what service levels were. So they came. Up up with this BDC yep. and the, I think the big, you know, the biggest onerous part of that is, is basically explaining that granular to the service address level, but then also like the technology and how you have to do it. So, so much Correct. more granularity. So if you can kind of speak to that a bit, that would be really helpful. Yeah. So, so that obviously they want you to report, you know, the address IDs that you can cover, right? So they're going to give you the fabric file. So when you, you go to CostQuest site, uh, FCC slash CostQuest, whatever it is, they, so 
uh, you go to their site, you register, you apply for their license, and then and then they take your old 477 data that you filed previously. So hopefully you filed, um, <laughs> and <laughs> and they basically determine what uh, what counties right you cover based on that right. So if you're in a county, they they just kind of give you the whole county's worth of addressing, and they put it all together in a file, zip it up, and then they give you send you a link to go get it. And so now, now you got to figure out what to do with it, right? So, but the hard part on that, I mean, there's there's two methods, right, to report. The first method is through a coverage polygon. Uh, I think this is the worst one because you're basically giving them a coverage polygon and saying, okay, you go determine where I can provide service. But when you do that, you also have to provide, I mean, it's literally volumes of information about the coverage model. I mean, they want stuff like the author of the coverage model, right? I mean, there's there's crazy requirements for when you upload a polygon uh, for the model, all of your radio parameters. Um, I mean, there's there's stuff down to like subcarrier power levels on the radios, right? <laughs> wow. And so so yeah, I mean, I mean, the, if you start reading through the document, I mean, we can't really go into all of it here, but but I mean, it is it is a crazy amount of data, and honestly. There's very few vendors, I think, in this industry that will, one, either willing to provide the data or can provide the data, right? Yeah, that's we can vouch for that. For that. <laughs> yeah. And so, so you know, just, just knowing what I know about <laughs> you know, some, some of the manufacturers and whatever, um, you know, that I may or may not have worked for in the past, uh, yeah. have, <laughs> have, have, um, yeah, no. right? <laughs> <laughs> it's very difficult to get information. I mean, I mean, yeah. even in, internally within these organizations, much less, um, you know, get, get somebody to send you the, those kind of specs on a radio, right. Or, mm-hmm. or on an antenna, um, you know, or, or anything. Right. So, so that, that presents a big problem. You know, it's, it's easy enough to generate a coverage polygon, but you know, if that's all you're going to submit and you got to have all this other data, I think you're really in a bad spot because I just don't think it's available. And so the other method is probably the one I think most people are going to use, which, you know, and I, I would encourage people to use it just because you do not have to provide all that technical data. And that is just providing which a list of addresses that you can cover. And so, you know, whatever method you use to do that, um, whether you kind of put, put your own overlay on a map, which maybe, maybe gets you back to the polygon stuff again, they may come back and say, well, if you determined your addresses using your own coverage map and doing kind of like a spatial intersect in a GIS platform or a spatial enabled database or something, you know, they may still come back and say, okay, well, you used the polygon. Now I still want all this technical data, right? So there's other methodologies you can use. Uh, some people are just saying, you know, I'm just going to submit the addresses I already have because I know I can service them. And, and that is the least amount of, you know, headache. Um, I, I guess that's a strategy. It's, it's probably not a great strategy because, you know, the idea of this whole thing is to determine where the government's going to give money out, right? I mean, that's uh, ult- the ultimate goal is to, you know, they're not looking to see, oh, well, yes, there's broadband here. We're going to encourage growth and, and development. No, they're going to encourage stuff by giving out money. And um, so, you know, if you don't care about somebody getting money to come over, build you, okay, do the minimum and, you know, just do the filing. Um, the other issue with that is that you've got to be able to prove um, that you can service those areas because this whole thing is going to be crowdsourced. Um, so, you know, the, the challenge is crowdsourced, right? So any Joe Blow from the general public can come in and say, oh, look, they say they service this address and I know they don't, you know, they, they come out here and they say they can't service the address or whatever the case may be. It could, it could just be some disgruntled guy you know, going in and, and to create headaches for you, right? I mean, so anybody can come in and say, no, they don't service these addresses. And now you have to come back and prove that you do. Hmm. And so it, it, that's one of the really onerous parts. I mean, I mean, the volume of data required to do the filing is, is really bad, but then put on top of it, the fact that anybody can come in and challenge your addresses. Now you've really got you know, problem. I mean, this could be a full-time job, right? For somebody just defending this filing, because if you file incorrectly, 
And, and it, even if it's, uh, I think even if it's just by mistake, right, you can still get fined. So, <laughs> so if you say, well, to the best of my knowledge, I was able to service that. It turns out I wasn't. Well, you should have done a better job, right? And, and I don't know how strict they're going to get. I hope they're not that bad. You know, in the past on the 477, it's pretty rare that they, they did any enforcement action unless somebody was just blatantly or willfully, you know, not filing and just kind of gave them the middle finger. Um, you know, it was pretty rare that, that um, they, you know, proceeded with some kind of enforcement action. But um, it seems like just the way they've been talking and the, the writing and the documents and stuff like that, it seems like they're going to get pretty serious about this. And the fines are pretty steep. Do you have any idea? 15 grand per incident. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's per well, incident. That, so, so that's that's how they're going to pay for all the money that they're giving out. They're just going to fine everybody to create <laughs> the money to pay for it later, right? I mean, right. that's typical government 101, right? <clears throat> yeah. Well, this is your new hobby, Tasso. Is you, all those places where your, your T-Mobile service doesn't work, you just document yeah, them yeah. and just like send oh. them in. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to go after T-Mobile so hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the mobile stuff is a little bit different, you know, but, but yeah, it's still, uh, it's still difficult to, um, you know, to file. I don't know what those guys, honestly, they, they got engineers on staff that can probably handle this stuff, but, um, but yeah, it, the, the, you know, just the fact that you got to collect so much data. So, and getting back to that, you know, if you do the addresses, you do have to explain your methodology, right? Like how I determined I could cover this address, right? But I, so, I don't understand. Sorry. I mean, not yeah, to cut you off. No, no, right? I mean, I, I've been absorbing all of this and I didn't realize it was that detailed, right? But I don't see how any company, no matter how big you are, can possibly quantify all of that. I mean, there's, there's so much, this is wireless we're talking about, right? So yeah. there, there's so many variables um that are involved in in getting accurate data and it's only as good as you know you know your output's only as good as what you put into it you that's know that's correct and, and that stuff is often you know flawed as well so i just don't see how anybody can potentially keep up with this and uh, yeah uh, it's just nuts yeah i would i would encourage people you know so it took them a while but we we submitted our um our methodology to the FCC, to the, you know, the BDC group over there now, and, and just said, Hey, if, if we say we can determine, you know, coverage at a certain place using this methodology, will that be acceptable? And they came back and said, you know, yes, you know, but watch out for this and this, which, you know, we already knew. Um, but, but, you know, so, so I would encourage anybody to, you know, to put that, you know, into the help desk or whatever, and just say, you know, can, can I use this methodology? You know, is this going to get kicked back or am I going to get fined if I try to do it this way and just see what they say? I mean, you know, I, I worry about people doing just kind of, like I said, and like you mentioned, Tassos, even the propagation stuff that we have in this industry, it's, it's okay for, you know, putting maps online and, and, you know, doing some, you know, go or no go type things for, um, you know, if you're going to be doing a site survey or try to cut down on your site surveys, I mean, it, it's adequate for that, but it's probably not adequate for this, right? right? I mean, just the models they're using, the resolution of stuff. And that's the other thing is they, they want this data to be super accurate, but they're only requiring uh, three arc second data in the models. Yeah, and so, no, that's not. I mean, that's, you know, that's like hundred meter data. That's their, that's their minimum resolution, Right. And that's terrible yeah. <laughs> for propagation really modeling. I mean, uh, you know, so it, it, it just, it, it's kind of baffling because they're saying on one hand, oh yeah, it's gotta be, it's gotta be super accurate. You better be right. And on the other hand, they're, they're only making you use uh, data that's, uh, you know, that, you know, hundred meters, that's a long way from where you're, you know, from where that point may be or whatever. And, and, you know, been that big, I mean, you could, you could have coverage in one little part of that and it would still color that, you know, that, that pixel yeah. on the map, right? <laughs> as and, long as you're within an acre of you're right. good, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I mean, that's a crazy, that's a crazy uh, requirement um, or non-requirement, I guess, on that side, you know? So, um, so it, I think it makes it really difficult because now they're saying, well, well, you said, you said you could cover this. Well, I just use hundred meter data in my propagation tool. Oh, sorry. You know, it wasn't right. So, you know, even though you, 
you thought you were doing it right. You didn't. So bam, you owe us 15 grand. Right. Mm -hmm. So, (laughs) so it's a, it's the conundrum uh, for sure. And uh, it's difficult to get information out of them. You know, they're pretty slow to respond. I think it took, I think it took me uh, something like 10 days to get a response about our methodology. Yeah, I'm sure you asked a lot earlier, like because when when is the dead the deadline is what September first for That's this correct. first filing? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So those last two weeks of August, basically, I'm sure they're just gonna be absolutely hammered. So Yeah, that and, and that's you know I, I I would encourage people to start to start on this, you know, yesterday. I, I mean it's just I can't I can't stress enough like how difficult a process this is for even people who know what they're doing with it. And if you don't know what you're doing with it, waiting to the last minute is really not the right idea. It's, right. you know, if it's something you haven't ever dealt with before and you're trying to go it on your own, you know, get started now. So what happens, what happens if you don't file? It's 15,000. I mean, if they, if they know about you, right. I mean, if you filed a four, seven, seven, um, they know about you, mm-hmm. right. Because they sent out emails to everybody start a few months back saying, okay, the fabric's ready, you know, get some sample data now. And so you're familiar with it, right? And you could go and get some sample files for your area, which of course they didn't change uh, all the IDs in for the live data. <laughs> Oops. So, so the sample stuff was, you know, I mean, it really was sample stuff. It's worthless if you can't file with it. So, um, but yeah, so uh, yeah, if you if you don't file, I'm sure they're going to come after you. So, I mean, one approach, maybe not necessarily a great idea, is you just don't file and say, I'm only going to take one $15,000 L and not worry about all the other ones. <laughs> that's, that's one I, way to look at it. I don't know. There may be a go to jail clause in there somewhere. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, they talk about forfeitures. And I think, I think when they say that the forfeiture is the, that's the money, right? $15,000. I, I don't know, you know, ultimately what the, um, you know, what the penalty is like, if you get fined and don't pay, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure there's, you know, th- there's probably some kind of prosecution that can happen. I yeah. don't know. I mean, because this is kind of codified into law. Now it used to just be a regulation by the FCC, right? The 477. But now that I think this is part of a law, you know, that was passed um, that they have to collect this data. And so, they can probably prosecute you now under that federal statute if right. you don't pay the fines. Um, I don't know why, you know, somebody would just want to pay 15 grand, but uh, you know, it's a lot cheaper just to do it. Um, but, but anyway, it's, <laughs> I guess it is up to the kind of the end, you know, the wisp at the end. I know we've had several small guys come to us and just say, man, I don't know how I'm going to get this done. And I don't really have the cash, you know, to pay for it and stuff. And um you know, my opinion on the whole thing is that I think I've studied this before. It's it's kind of really it's kind of really meant to favor the big carriers, the big players, and kind of push the small guys out because the sure. the regulatory burden and the financial burden that's going to be placed on them to get this done. Well, and you know, when if you're uh you know an operator where you're primarily unlicensed everything, right? At least unlicensed in mile, we're not really you know, available to get into this bead fundings and stuff like that. Like you're, it's offering mm-hmm. you no protection to say your area. You know, if you've got a big GAA build on CBRS, then yes, you're like, all right, this area is covered. Here's the speeds, you know, this yep. is a served area. Right. And it would make a lot of sense to protect yourself from that case. But you know, a five gig wisp out there, you know, and six and everything that comes down the road, you know, they're basically all the, they're doing all this work and submitting all this information so they can not protect themselves from anything because they're still, you know, it's an unserved right. not area. A, not according. eligible. Right. Exactly. So yeah, that's a, a very sort of painful thing. You know, you would hope there would be some sort of clauses that allow for small business and definition levels and stuff like that, because, you know, this big government money is not really, 
chased and affected that heavily by, you know, some operator that's got, you know, 500,000, you know, 500 subs or a thousand subs or something like that. You know, that's not the, the numbers they're kind of gunning for from a coverage perspective, at least. You right. know, it seems to me that way, the, the logical way of thinking about this, but this is the government we're talking about. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be tough, uh, for the small guys. And I feel for those guys, you know, we were there at one point and, and we certainly didn't have the, all these regulatory things when we started, you know, back in 2003, um, it was kind of, you know, what, what is it? What was, uh, what was it math that had the, uh, wireless cowboys or was that Rory, I guess maybe, you know, so, somebody had the wireless cowboys blog for a while, um, you know, talking about all this stuff back in the day, you know, just how to make it work. And I mean, you know, I mean, shoot, I designed my own antennas because, you know, when I started there, nobody was making antennas for this industry, you know? And, uh, yeah. So my partner who actually was an antenna designer, uh, he actually designed antennas for a good portion of the cellular industry. He was a contract engineer and he designed antennas for people like decibel products and, uh, Catherine Scala, you know, uh, antenna products, uh, you know, so Allen telecom, all the big players back in the day, he pretty much was their design engineer. And so we actually sat in my garage with a, uh, what's called a slot line and a, <laughs> and a, a, a spectrum analyzer and waveform generator and a function generator. And, and uh, drew things out on a Smith chart, you know, to design antennas, you know, <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, so it was, it was a lot of fun, but, but they worked really well. You know, we used them for years. They were slotted waveguide and I did some horns. I think Tassos has seen those before. Yep. And um, yeah, so it was, it was a lot of fun, but, but yeah, I mean, you know, back in the day, there just wasn't anything going and, and here we are, these, you know, these wireless operators, you know, providing services to people that nobody else would. And you know, now they're just kind of like, oh, hey, yeah, you know, that was all great. But, you know, we're going to we're just going to squash you on the bottom of our shoe. And yeah, hopefully you come off as we walk along, you know. So <laughs> it's kind of sad that, you know, that, that the federal government doesn't really recognize, um, you know, the efforts of, of the, the entrepreneurs out here, you know, doing this work and, um, you know, making it making it very difficult to uh, to proceed. So, but, uh, you know, hopefully we can provide some assistance for some people and, and, um, if they need it and, and hopefully people don't get the fines if they decide to, uh, kind of go it alone and, and make some mistakes, you know, I'm, I'm hoping they're a little forgiving on this first round, but they, they may be looking to make some examples too. I, I think like anything though, I mean, you know, the government tends to go after people who can pay, right? You can't get blood from a rock either, right? <laughs> right. So so I, I, I seriously doubt uh, you know, they're gonna be going after the the really small guy that can't afford to pay it. I think it's the the medium sized uh, upper ones that, you know, have uh some cash to burn and yeah. Uh, we'll po we'll probably be the, and that's if you know, we're, we're saying here that, you know, they're going to start targeting some people and make some examples. They're going to have to, obviously they, they already started doing it with calf and art off. Right. Uh, we've heard about these, I mean, pennies on a dollar. I mean, with these like $3,000 fines or something like that. I mean, it hasn't been like, you know, millions and millions of dollars, but, uh, yeah, yeah I mean, it's going to happen. It's, 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 it's that simple. I also think for some of the smaller guys, um, I mean, obviously they, they don't want to get fined. So if anything, they have to do the minimal, like you said, just guarantee the ones yeah. that they know, the, the ones that they, they, the, the addresses they actually serve. So yes, it won't protect you from a build out, but at the same time, you know, even though it's free money, right, you, you there's still limited resources and people to do these things. So as you know, I would imagine as a company that received all this money, it's going to be like, am I actually going to go? and fight the fight to try and overbuild this guy who's already there when I have money to go just and, and keep keep the government happy by building out the areas that truly are underserved. So I think it's going to be a while uh, before, you know, these little guys or whatever, you know, kind of get overbuilt. So I, I think that, yeah, the best defense, if you don't have the money is to at least file what you know you can so you don't get fined, you're done pretty simple process. And if somebody's going to come and overbuild you with license, they're going to do it no matter what. Right. So. Yeah, no, I, I, I tend to agree with that. And um, you know, the, the fact that these guys are, you know, having to be put in that situation where, you know, they've got to just, 
you know, kind of describe what they already serviced. Uh, you know, that may be also a risky strategy as well. You know, I was thinking about that a little bit. And, and if you do that, and because you have to describe, again, if you use the address methodology, you know, or submission, you have to describe how you determined, right? And if you just put it like a little paragraph, well, I, I know because I already serviced these, well, they may say, well, that's not, that's not within the spirit of, you know, the, the filing. I mean, we want to know where you can service too. you know, the other places you can service. And so, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit worried that if you do that, they may come back and say, well, you didn't, you didn't follow what we asked. You know, this is not where you do service. This is where you can service. And, you know, the, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how strict they're going to get. And I hope they don't uh, on that sure. kind of stuff, just because again, that now that puts another burden on, on these guys, you know, who thought they might get away with, you know, kind of a, a small effort. And then all of a sudden they're coming back and saying, no, nope, go back and do it right. You know, just, uh, just increment the street address by one number, right? So <laughs> yeah, I can, I I can say, serve I mean, 907 main street. I can also yeah. serve 908, you know, so. yeah. well, how far exactly. does that go out? You know? <laughs> right. yeah. yeah. This is not legal advice. Anyone listening? Um, well, well, we all know that that doesn't actually work, right? I mean, <laughs> true, true, we've all been in true. situations where you this got house, house is covered. And, this house is yeah, not. Yeah. And the guy right next door is no freaking way that's happening, right? So, yeah, um, yeah. Unfortunately, I I wish it was that easy because you could just kind of cascade that along. But <laughs> but yeah, and the enforcement side of it again with the actual address data being just so janky too. Like it's hard to. Mm -hmm to do a full level enforcement. So, you know, if, as long as, yeah, I mean, it seems to me, as long as you're submitting what you can following the letter of the law, but also more or less the spirit, at least in the beginning, you know, it's yeah. like, it's worth doing and like not getting yourself tied up in a full blown panic. Right. Cause I mean, it is sure, going to be yeah. an iterative sort of stumble through process. So, you know, yeah. don't think yeah. that if you can't, totally you know do all this that it's the end of the world so yeah and i think it's filing filing something is better than nothing like you said i mean uh, i'm sure the initial red flags will be do we have a 477 for this person yes and do we mm -hmm. have the new filings no that's a red flag it's almost like the irs and paying your taxes as long as you pay something every year they see revenue coming in they look they look for the guy that all of a sudden stopped paying for a period right. of time like red flag what happened you know and uh, so, oh yeah yeah, I, I think that's probably the case too. That's going to be a big part of it. Uh, I do know, you know, in in the it seems like the last three years they've been stepping up more and more on the 477 enforcement too. Um, not necessarily fining people, but I know uh, it used to be you submitted the stuff and you never heard anything, right? And now they're coming back with, I mean, tiny little details within, you know, in the filings. So if you have a speed. Uh, in your subscription file that's higher than the speeds in the deployment file, like your max, what you claim is your maximum. Um, th they come back and say, why, you know, how are you delivering the speed when you don't claim that you can, mm -hmm. right? And then you have to explain to them, well, it's a one-off situation. I've got a point-to-point -point link to this guy, or I've got this, or I've got that. And sometimes they say, okay, we'll take that one out then, or take those out if you're doing that. We don't want them. Um, you know, we want to see what you provide to everybody. And sometimes they accept it and just say, okay, fine. You know, so I think it really depends on the, uh, whoever you get. Um, that's kind of, you know, I've seen some guys get real picky about it. Some of the guys that are sending out these emails and some people just say, okay, fine. You know, we'll accept your explanation. But, um, but that's been coming down a lot harder in the last, especially the last two years, I've noticed. There's been a lot of kickbacks on small little things like that, right? And, and a lot of this comes from you know, the, the billing systems that, that produce these files. And, and um, you know, this includes VISP. I mean, there's no, there's no um, setting in these programs to say, okay, here's the speed I'm selling versus the speed they're provisioning, right? And so when they create these subscription files, they use the provision speeds because that's really the only data they have. It's not, they don't have like a blank in there, you know, in the, in the form that says, oh, I'm selling 50 meg, right? And that's what I need to file in the FCC 477. They're, you know, they just have the speeds that get provisioned, which might be, you know, 50.5 because they want to over provision a little bit. So when people 
constantly run the speed test, they're seeing 50, right? So, uh, you know, just to eliminate that overhead, they might, you know, th- that gets lost in the speed test and stuff. So, um, so you get a lot of these files that come in, subscription files and things like that from the billing systems that have these decimals. Well, they don't want decimals anymore, right? They, if, if it's under, if it's over two meg, they don't want a dec- They don't see any decimals. And so, if you have a decimal, they kick it back, right? So, <laughs> so even though the the billing systems do a pretty good job on the subscription files, um, they're not they're not perfect. And so those even have to be gone through now. And, you know, it used to be that you could file with three decimal points. They didn't care now. Nope. No decimals. So um, they kick it back. And so, so yeah, it, it, it's gotten more complex and, and uh, definitely they're enforcing it more. Um, you know, they're coming back with little tiny picky things. And I think that's just, their kind of, that was kind of the ramp up to you know, this new BDC stuff. So I anticipate they're going to get pretty picky. And, um, you know, I don't know that they have the staff to get super piggy, but, uh, I think they're going to get a little bit and, um, they're going to start kind of going through it. So, uh, that's just been my experience on, you know, on the FCC side and, um, you know, of course the deployment stuff, uh, almost all the billing systems do a terrible job with deployment because, um, yeah, they don't have, they don't have any kind of coverage uh, built in. Uh, to the programs, you know, so, um, you know, finding out other, other than just blocks that you currently have service in, which is kind of drastically underestimating, you know, your, your area, um, you know, if you file that, okay. I mean, that's, you can certainly do that, but um, I encourage people to take advantage of the fact that the 477 doesn't require <laughs> necessarily, you know, uh, good propagation. There's no model requirement or anything like that to get your coverage and where you can provide service. So I always, I always told people, yeah, be, be optimistic in your reporting on that because it does help keep government money away. But uh, my strategy on BDC has changed a little bit. I'd, I'd say if anything, be conservative, <laughs> you know, <laughs> with the BDC stuff, because uh, you've got, you've got the burden of proof now. So so, and that's, that's a whole nother thing, kind of going back to the, the PE side of things. So PE professional engineer, uh, anyone that's not really familiar with it, which is a legal thing, like as a licensing yep. thing done at the state level, if I understand it correctly. That's right. Um, yeah. When I graduated, I looked at doing it very briefly and was like, Nope, I'm good. So this is <laughs> one, I don't, I don't need my name out there in that many places, but two, like, you know, I was double E, right. So, you know, for me, it, it just didn't make sense with where my career was headed. But so, and that, that conversation is basically, you know, the, the government requiring some sort of official s- or official sign off on what this data and who is submitting it. Right. So, and as I understand it is basically a PE signs off on it, or there is some level of, uh, executive sign off is available based on having a certain level of experience, you know, Mm -hmm. 10 years, seven years. So if you can kind of speak to that, like, the back and forth part of that conversation, because I know it's something that y'all been involved with too, you know, understanding what that means. Yeah. So they, so they gave a waiver. Uh, you do have to kind of apply for the waiver. It's just kind of like a one line thing that you say, I'm, I'm applying for the waiver on the PE requirement and here is, are my qualifications, right? So it has to be either a double E, um, with direct knowledge, right. Of your network design. Uh, so it, this is not like a contract hire kind of thing. This is okay. I'm a double E and I work for this company. I help design the network. Right. Uh, and, and you have to have at least seven years of experience in, in wireless network design. And so, uh, or, or, or whatever network, right. I mean, this is, you know, obviously our audience here is probably mostly wireless guys, but, but, you know, this goes, this goes the same for, you know, fiber cable, you know, DSL, you know, satellite, whatever, right. This is all, this all had, they all have the same requirements and it's a little bit easier for those guys because obviously they know their addresses and things like that because they pass them, right. They either pass them with a pole or they pass them underground and they can get service. So that's really easy to do those, but um, the wireless is much more complex, unfortunately, but yeah. So, so it has to be a guy that has a double E that has seven years of experience or um, another person with what they say, what has specialized training in 
this network design and has at least 10 years of experience. And again, it's a direct knowledge thing as well. So, um, you know, so if you've been in business 10 years and you designed your own network, um, you, and hopefully you've taken some classes or something along the way where you can say, I received some specialized training. I mean, I, I'm not sure on the job training of you know, trial and error is, is acceptable. I mean, I, <laughs> I've listened I, to many webinars, <laughs> many webinars. Yeah. I am very well trained. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very well versed in inside wireless, uh, it, yeah, <laughs> videos. It would, <laughs> it would probably be good to, you know, at least have some class that you've taken that you can say, oh yeah, I received some specialized training. I, I mean, I don't, I mean, that's their wording. So who knows how strict they're going to be about specialized training or whatever that is, but, but that that's the wording. And so, so, so they've said it's yeah. like three, the first three cycles, how long yep. is the cycle? Is that a year? Is that six a months. quarter? Six yeah, months. Six so months. for the next year and a half, basically you have to figure this out. Mm -hmm. So, so next June or the you know filing due next September, you know, of 2023 will be the last waiver period. Now, who knows? They may extend it. They may wipe out the requirement sure. altogether. You know, who knows what they're going to do between now and then, but you've got three at least uh, for now, <laughs> you know, unless, unless they come back after this thing's over yeah. after the first filing and say, geez, we got a ton of idiots to <laughs> file these things. So, you know, we're, <laughs> we're going to put the PE requirement back in. So I, I don't know. I mean, who knows what they, what they're going to do. Right. Um, they kind of change stuff on a whim. So there's a lot of old retired PEs out there that are looking for side gigs. There's <laughs> a bunch of wisps out there. They're going to want to hire right. you, uh, hire you on and uh, do something with that. I, I tried to get uh, my former partner. Now he's, he's almost 90. So I tried to get him to, to come in and, and, you know, I said, how long has your certification been, you know, gone? And surprisingly, it's only been a couple of years. I mean, he kept it for a long time. But, uh, you know, also to be a PE, it, going back to what you said, Caleb, it is a state licensed deal. So it's kind of like being a lawyer, right? You got to take the bar in your state and then get licensed by your state to practice law. So it's kind of the same thing. It's a professional engineer's license. And so you take your P, the PE exam in that state to be able to practice, you know, engin professional engineering, I guess, in that state, right? Uh, now, you know, most states, just like with lawyers, like if you apply, you know, if you say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm working here temporarily, you know, I'd like to, you know, be able to certify documents or drawings or whatever it is with your PE stamp. A lot of states will just say, okay, you know, fine, just fill out this form and pay your 25 bucks or whatever it is. And yeah, we'll, we'll allow you to stamp stuff in our state, you know, but, um, so, you know, it's kind of the same thing, um, but it is a it is a difficult thing to get, and uh, it's a difficult thing to keep. There's an ongoing education requirement, right? So you have to do a continuing education every year, so many hours of continuing education. Or it's just like any license. license, yeah. You know, an accountant, you have to do the same thing. A lawyer, mm -hmm. you have to do the same thing. So yeah, yeah. So so I mean, you know, these guys are experienced and and they know their stuff. I mean, it's a, it's not a, it's not an easy thing. I mean, I looked at the exam like to go take it because I think they they in a lot of states they have a waiver. Uh, if you didn't take the EIT, you know, if you have so many years of experience, you can still go take the PE exam, right? But but man, I mean, it it's intense. I mean, the math stuff. I I haven't done that kind of math <laughs> since college. You know, I mean, you know, solving differential equations and things. I mean. You know, I could, I could go back and review it, but I'd probably have to study for a year before I go take the thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's like the CFA exam or something. You know, everybody fails the second one or something like that, and you go study for a year and come back and take it again, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't have that kind of mental bandwidth left anymore. Right. So. Yeah, I'm just a little busy yeah. <laughs> right yeah. now. You know, and it's it's a whole different beast, you know, for, for a, a structural PE to sign off on a tower design, right? Like the, the low stresses and the wind lows, like these are all, mm -hmm. you know, not simple, but they're very well defined, you know, how a PE right. signs off on a tower or a bridge or, you know, a power system, you know, for some machine or whatever it may be, you know, for, for a PE to sign off on this wireless system that might have... 20 vendors worth of equipment in it, right. you know, between the wireless, the network side, the mechanical side and everything else, you know, and this is kind of nebulous thing, right? Especially when they're not following, you know, LTE standards and stuff like even the, the, the full on standards based stuff is hard enough, but now, you know, with the, the, the mix of equipment and everything else, it's, 
you know, I, I, it, it would be a, a tough proposition without someone who's not, you know, I'm a PE, but, you know, I do this on the side or, you know, specifically focus on this particular niche. Well, it, you know, it gets even harder uh, for them because it's one thing if you, you know, I, and, and like I said, I came from the cellular world where everything was documented down to the, you know, decimal points. Right. And so, you know, you knew exactly what was on every tower, where you, what antennas you were using, how much coax was up there, you know, what the sweep test looked like on that line. I mean, I mean, it, it was all very, very well engineered. And I think, you know, we start people, people are signing up with us and stuff right now. And, and, you know, we have to get AP information. There's just no way around it. We got to know what they're using, transmit powers, antennas. And it, it's really surprising how many guys don't know you know, this stuff about their network. And <laughs> if, if there's one benefit out of this whole thing, it's going to be uh, that it gets people to engage in better, you know, network practices. The right? whole global <laughs> noise floor is about to drop 20 dB. You know? right. I, I mean, I, I mean, there's, there's people who don't know what direction their antennas face. And oh, we you know, know. I'm, not, I, I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to yeah. disparage people. I mean, they're doing, you know, good work trying to get internet to, to people, but you know, guys that, that don't have a background in, in engineering or, or, um, you know, any kind of, even like manufacturing or anything like that, that, that are just trying to fill a need. I mean, I can understand that it's, it's a testament, a uh, really good testament to our, most of the manufacturers out there that people can just throw this stuff up and it works as well as it does. You know, um, I mean, that, that's pretty good because, you know, without having any engineering behind it, you're just, you know, popping something in the air and attaching some cables that you've never tested before. Uh, you know, you're not, you're not doing sweep tests to make sure that you're within tolerance. You bought off of eBay. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, or you made yourself, you know, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, put that up there with Omnis. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, so, and, and you don't, I mean, Omni, it will almost be preferable to some of the yeah. stuff because, you know, at least, at least you don't know, have to know the direction, yeah. but <laughs> you know, some of the, some of the stuff you guys are coming in going, well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how many, you know, I guess they know some, somewhat how many antennas they have on a site, but they don't know what direction they face. You know, they don't know if they have down tilt. they don't know what transmit powers are on the radios. Um, you know, it's not documented anywhere. And that's, that's, to me, that's quite surprising, uh, you know, because I would I would never do that. But um, but I think it's going to force people into much better, <laughs> you know, network practices, you know, to figure out what's where, you know. And I, I don't know how you get away with it for so long. If you've got a large network, you know, you're just going to kill yourself with interference if you don't know where you're facing with what frequencies and power outputs, you know. So. That may that may be some of the issues with <laughs> guys that are having trouble with speeds and things, you know. Mm -hmm. It's but um, but certainly uh, it's got to be gathered, and uh, and it it you know if you don't have it, it's probably going to take you some time to go get it. And uh, so start now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, think yeah. about all these these whiffs that have you know grown, and you know they they got it figured out. They're really cranking, and they start buying these other smaller you know competitors and stuff. And mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times these buyouts, they're you know they're they're good to have the network documented like at all, right? So you know now you've got to go back and force all those maintenance things to be like, hey, we have to report this accurately. We have our new stuff, but you know we bought yeah. out Jim Bob's network a year and a half ago that kind of works okay. And that now they've got to basically fully review and, and document everything with that. So it's going to be going to be onerous. Well, I can tell you it makes, you know, just on the network documentation side, it makes things really easy if you ever do want to sell. So I'll tell you a little story about when we sold to Jab, right? Um, they wanted to come in and spend a week, like going to every tower site and looking over our stuff and everything. Well, one of the things that we built into Wismon, and this was really pretty much for ourselves. You know, we, in fact, when I built first started building Wismon, we never intended on selling it. It was just a tool for internal use. And then people started asking if they could buy it, and we didn't even have billing in it at that point. It was just a literally just you know kind of a network management subscriber management tool, um, so that we could you know see where everybody was and keep track of everything. You know, it was basically our network documentation, um, and 
So we would take pictures of everything and store them with, you know, the data we had, I mean, every parameter of every single site, you know, every antenna, every radio, you know, what we used, when it was changed, you know, when it was added, you know, whatever uh, in, in the system. And I said, well, what do you guys want to know? I mean, I can, I can give you access to this and we can generate reports on this. They didn't even go look at one site when they came in and they saw that data was there available you know, they didn't go, they said, oh, we don't need to go. If you got it all here and you got, I mean, we had pictures of, you know, our electrical boxes. We had pictures of the cabling. We had pictures of, you know, the radios, how they were hooked to the antennas, the front, the back, you know, <laughs> what it looked like from the view on the tower, you know, from the antenna. So, so, I mean, I would encourage it. That, and that's a lot of detail, but I know most of these systems can handle, you know, putting in that kind of data, you know, um, I would encourage people to start using, you know, whether it's it's VISP or Sonar or PowerCode or Splinks or, you know, any, any of the systems that are out there, I'm pretty sure they all have ways that you can document your information and, and add pictures and things like that. I would say, go do that because it makes stuff like this a lot easier <laughs> yeah. when it comes down to having to get that information, uh, you know, quickly, uh, you know, you know, and you never know, you know, you never know what the government's going to require of you, uh, you know, for being in business these days. So it just, it just makes sense. Plus, like I said, makes it a lot easier when you go to sell something, it's a lot more impressive to a buyer to know that they're, what they're getting into than to, uh, have to, you know, kind of figure it out. So I guarantee you, if it's a mess, they're going to come in and go, yeah, we're going to drop the price, you know, by half a million bucks yeah. or whatever. hundred dollars a sub. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so yeah, it, it's a good idea to get into that practice. Yeah. I mean, you know, data is king and it's never going to be like, it's going to be less useful. Right. And it, it yeah. seems that, you know, as painful as it be, like the government's just going to continue sticking their, uh, uh, appendages <laughs> into this industry kind of more and more as they drive for this, you know, sort of utopian concept of universal coverage. So it's, you know, document, learn, grow, and, you know, it's just, it's going to be a part of it. So, but like you said, there's a ton of benefits that will behoove you in the grand scheme of things. So don't think this is just for, you know, for the government. Oh, yeah. And this is, there's, there's, you know, there's a little bit of a sweet side to that medicine at least. So. Yeah, for sure. It, uh, it can, it can be advantageous in a number of ways. So, all right, Cam, man, we could probably sit here and talk about this for a long time. You know, there's just, there's so many yeah. little interesting side paths and everything we could run down, but you know, I think we've hit the main points, you know, again, educating the folks out there, differences between 477 and BDC, the PE side, the requirement side, and what this really means for you in the real world and where it could be going. So, you know, to, to kind of wrap this up, do you have any really closing remarks or, you know, anything you want to point particularly to? attention to you? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I've said it multiple times, but uh, this is really important that, that you get this in and, and try to be as accurate as possible. But the most important thing is right now, just get it going. I mean, don't wait on this because it is a lot of data that you have to collect. It's a lot of information. Uh, the filing itself is a lot of data. So yeah, get, get started, you know, with, with however you're going to get it done. So that's, that's my, those are my words of advice right now. Yep. Don't, don't sleep on this, everybody. It's real and we've <laughs> got to get it done. So, uh, right. for, for the folks out there that are looking, uh, you know, to get in contact with you, Cameron, you know, where can they find you? What's your contact, your company? You know, we mentioned in the beginning regulatory solutions, but you know, a little bit about this, the, to put a fine dot on kind of the services that you offer. Sure. Yeah. We can talk a little bit about that. So it's regulatory solutions.us. And uh, that's our website. Um, it's myself and Brian Webster and Robert Olive. Uh, Brian's got a big background in, you know, of course, doing lots of network uh, design and wireless mapping. He runs another company called wirelessmapping.com, uh, provides a lot of services for people doing, you know, design work, regulatory work, and things like that. Um, just, and, and one other thing I forgot to mention while we were talking earlier on the regulatory side, a lot of financial institutions, right? I was talking to John Scribner, um, you know, and he's, he's with a lending institution now and um, they require compliance 
right? And so if you're borrowing money from people, you've got to be in compliance. And he was really excited about the fact that we could actually, in fact, we, we worked to deal with him uh, to put into our software uh, to you know, allow third party, you know, allow communication with third party, you know, people about your compliance, right? So they can go in and put in like his okay. email address. Hippo That's compliance. right. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So it allows us to share that information and not not detailed information, just saying yes, they filed, and here's like the file summary or whatever, right? That's what we're sending out. So he was very excited about that. Uh, so anyway, back to what we do. Um, right now, we're focused mostly on FCC four seven seven and BDC filings. We do the state stuff too. So like. California, you know, CPUC or whatever out there has a requirement. I think there's a couple other states that may be about to start requirements for state filings on this stuff too. Uh, we'll be able to handle that. We've had some requests about other things like, you know, 499s and, um, you know, and then certifications for like the RDOF stuff or the CAF2 certifications, you know, people have to do. Um, we, we can do that as well. We're, we're not focused on it right now because there's such a time crunch. Um, you know, once we get past this filing date, we can probably help people with that as well. But right now we're kind of focused, you know, all our time and effort on, on getting the BDC stuff together. And so, uh, that's really what it is. You know, it's, it, it is, you know, kind of a, kind of a side gig for us. Um, just because we, we all have other <laughs> full-time jobs. Um, you know, like I said, I'm CTO at VISP right now as well. And, and, um, but, and we are doing just, just FYI. And I know there's only a couple of days. I'm looking at my date clock here, it's four days left, five days left in the month. So, um, we are doing a, an early bird special. We might extend that another week or so, but uh, we're just trying to encourage people to get, you know, data to us. If they're going to use us, you know, sign up, get data to us now, because it is a lot of data. And, like our PE is only one guy right now. We have another guy that we're talking to, so we may have two here. But um, it, you know, it takes a little while for him to do the the certification, right? Because he's going to go verify. He's going to take a sampling of addresses and run his own methodology on them and make sure that you know it, it is what we say it is. And so um, it takes a little bit of time, and and so he's only got so many hours in the day. Plus, he does lots of other work. So, um, you know, we, we encourage people to get that stuff in. And, and I would say probably for any other vendors out there that are helping people with this, you know, I'm, I'm guessing they want the data as soon as possible. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I know where we are with it. And so it's, you know, I'm sure everybody else is, is kind of freaking out as well. Like, you know, we got to get this stuff in because, man, you wait till the last week and, we can't guarantee that we're going to get it done you know, in time. So, all right. Well, that has been great information. Cameron, really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. Um, trying to educate folks out there the best we can. You know, it's one of the goals that we push on. So it's been a great conversation. Uh, Tassos, anybody looking for us, where can they find us? You can find us everywhere on social media. You can find us on Facebook, on all the wisp type groups, uh, on Instagram, uh, and, you know, the best place is on our website, rfelements.com, or on our forum, rfelab.com. All right, all right. Well, next time, until we talk to everybody out there, y'all be good out there. Thanks. See ya. All right. See you guys. Thanks.